Notebook 8 The Neuville Saint Vast Sector From the 15th of November 1915 to the 29th of February 1916 Part 1 It was the 15th of November 1915 Almost a month ago, the bloody offensive that had started on September 25 was finally halted. But still, the soldiers had to work day and night under terrible conditions, while winter approached and their officers ate well, slept well, and spent pleasant evenings singing and laughing in a world completely foreign to that of the soldiers. Some Poilus began to show signs of revolt, including the grenadiers of Barthus's unit, who the previous day refused to work, citing sickness. Though, in the end, due to being rejected by their new and terrible Dr. Colombier, they all had to return to work, with only one private still refusing to work and going back to sleep. Barthus wrote that that evening he had been assigned to guard duty at the police station, so he had not been capable of taking an active part in the movement. Still, he was suspected of being one of its instigators, and his superiors were looking for the first opportunity to get rid of him. Meanwhile, the private who refused to work was taken before the company's two dictators, Captain Croix-Mayreville and Commandant Kansgram. They wished to make an example of the private by sending him to a court-martial, but the private protested vigorously that the food they were being given was completely insufficient, and it was impossible for him and his comrades to carry out the exhausting work they were being assigned. The two officers feared that these protests from the private would bring them trouble in the future, so they only gave him eight days of prison and did not speak further about the incident with the grenadiers. On November 19th, the soldiers left Meril for the trenches at 11 a.m. under heavy fog. After a few hours, they settled in a communication trench which led to the front line. In the position occupied by the grenadiers, there was no shelter to speak of. This indifference by the officers to the soldiers' condition surprised no one. General Niesel had even forbidden the men from digging individual shelters into the trench wall, because it could compromise its solidity, and he also forbade soldiers from seeking shelter in mine shafts or trenches leading to listening posts so they could get out fast enough in case of an alert. The Poilus' stay in that trench was also livened by the presence of four French mortars nearby, who had been targeted by the German artillery. Huge craters could be seen all around and in the middle of the trench, needed little to reassure them. At night, the mortar teams left to sleep in the rear positions, and the Poilus took advantage of this, and occupied the big shelters the mortar operators had dug for themselves. They stayed in one place for several months at a time, while the Poilus only stayed in the same spot for three or four days. Each night there, the soldiers also had an unpleasant assignment. They had to carry heavy rolls of barbed wire up to the front line. This required 20 men to carry the rolls across trenches and craters. In the darkness, it would often get tangled up with the barbed wire that already crossed the trenches, and it took enormous effort to untangle it. It could take them half the night to cover 60 or 80 meters, and they ended up with their skin and clothes torn and scratched by the wire. The work was extremely noisy, and the Germans could certainly hear it, but they never fired a shot. This was reciprocal. They never fired at each other's work details, and Barthas wrote that this tacit agreement made by the soldiers on both sides probably saved thousands of lives. They finally left this trench on November 22nd, and Barthas's grenadier team occupied a listening post installed behind the barricade in a trench system which was also occupied by the Germans. Bartha said that this listening post was made in accordance with recent instructions from General Niesel, and he congratulated the general for it, 
It was the first time one of their big chiefs showed the slightest concern for the well-being of the Poilus. There was a piece of sheet metal across the top that served as a roof for the sentinels, and a screen of metallic mesh farther to the rear to ward off bombs and grenades. And there was also a small dugout seven or eight steps deep where the soldiers could rest and take shelter between watches. In this forward post they could not put their head above the parapet to survey the surroundings, because the place was infested with German snipers, who were extremely well hidden and fired immediately and accurately at anything that moved. The Poilus were given periscopes to survey the surroundings, but despite their best efforts to use them in secret, the snipers shattered three of the periscopes. The German forward post was so well hidden and its snipers were so dangerous that the Poilus did not even know where exactly it was located. On November 25th, at 5 a.m., Barthas was carefully pacing from the forward post to the trench and then back again to keep his feet warm and battle the cold. Just as he was reaching the post, there were two grenade detonations right at his feet that knocked him to the ground and surrounded him with smoke and flames. But luckily, all he had was the ends of his mustache singed. The two sentries, Viel and Rock, were not so lucky. They were gravely wounded and screaming that they were going to die. But luckily, they were immediately hauled to the first aid station, where they were stabilized and evacuated. A third sentry, a private pastel from Paris, had his nose slightly scorched. He also went to the first aid station with the hope of being evacuated, but was only given a few drops of iodine on his nose and he returned to the listening post greatly disappointed. A few days later, their sergeant Ford, for whom Pestel served as a personal servant, wrote him a glorious citation that read, As a sentinel, he returned to his post after having his wound looked after, refusing to be evacuated. Barthas wrote that Pestel must have laughed a lot at that. Meanwhile, Barthas also wrote that the Poilus suspected the grenades had exploded in the hands of the two sentries due to their mishandling them. And indeed, when they cleaned up the mess in daylight, they found that the fragments were from French grenades. But they all agreed to report that the post had been attacked by German grenades. In this way, everyone was happy. The wounded sentries were treated as heroes instead of being punished for their clumsiness, and their superiors could report that grenade attacks at the forward posts had been repulsed. Barthas wrote that only he himself encountered unpleasant results. Sergeant Ford said loudly to the captain, It is not astonishing that this forward post was surprised. Corporal Barthas must have been sleeping. This gave the captain the idea to launch an inquiry. Barthas' superiors wished to be rid of him and his anti-militarist ideas by sending him to a court-martial. But this time they were not successful. Sub-Lieutenant Malvezi had been making his rounds in the trench, and he stopped to chat with Barthas a moment before the explosions. And, as Sergeant Mark and Barthas's grenadier Sergeant Lasser had also talked with him between 4 and 5 a.m., they all attested to this spontaneously and vigorously, at the risk of making enemies of the captain and the commandant, who then had to leave Barthas alone. The soldiers were not asked for more information about this incident, and that same day at one in the afternoon they were relieved by the 281st Infantry Regiment, and they arrived at the town of agnès le duisan at nightfall to spend six days of rest. During those days the rain was such that the men were forced to stay inside their billets, and they spent their time hunting lice. Each palu had thousands of the vermin in all shapes, sizes and colors, crawling and hiding in their body and clothes. Whether peasant or Parisian, the lice made no distinction, and they feasted on their skin. Some men rubbed themselves all over in gasoline every night. Others carried small sachets of camphor, and others powdered themselves in insecticide. But nothing worked, 
and where one parasite died, ten more took its place. This was all due to the filthy bedding of the soldiers, which was never changed, and the impossibility of doing laundry. The cold was such that if anything was washed, it froze solid, and the Poilus had no means to thaw and dry their clothes. One day a private asked the captain if their straw could be changed. The captain did not even deign to respond, simply showing his generosity by not punishing the man. The officers did not care about the state of the Poilus. Their own beds were comfortable and clean. On December 1st, after five days of hunting lice, the soldiers returned to the trenches, just as lousy as they had left. After days of torrential rain, the trenches were a flooded mess. It took Barthes' squad ten hours to move through them and reach their position in a reserve trench. They had to spend their night in a deep but small shelter. It was almost impossible to sleep as the Poilus were all jammed together, soaked with rain and sweat. Barthas wrote that as he became numb with sleepiness, he thought about how some people could not sleep because their beds were not made just right. The next day, both Barthas and his friend Ventresque benefited from the generosity of a group of telephone operators who let them sleep in their neighboring shelter. One evening, they were woken up and sent for an unexpected work detail. When Barthas and Ventresque returned two hours later, they found to their horror that the shelter had collapsed under an enormous mound of earth and mud. The torrential rains and craters due to artillery fire were compromising the stability of the trenches. If it hadn't been for the sudden work detail, they would have been buried alive, and it took them several hours to dig out their weapons and packs from the pile of mud. Despite the exhausting work they all did to keep the trenches passable, they were becoming more and more unstable with every passing day. Some rationers met horrible deaths buried alive in landslides, and Barthas wrote that one day they had to work for four hours to dig out a medical officer from the 296th Regiment, who was lucky that the Poilus had been close enough to hear his cries for help. Under the thin layer of water or liquid mud, there was always a far thicker and terrible layer of mud that grabbed tight onto men like cement. The signal men, rationers and couriers, who in ordinary times were envied for not having to stay at the front lines, suffered the most. Often having to go out alone, they could get stuck and have to wait for hours for help, if help ever arrived. In this, Barthas wrote that he had to give credit to General Niesel, who had the courage to go up to the very front lines to see the state of the trenches, even when in certain spots he had to walk with water up to his belly. The general encouraged the soldiers and gave orders that once the Palus went back to their encampments, they were to be left alone. And he also ordered that piles of reserve foodstuffs be brought to the trenches so that the soldiers wouldn't starve if blockaded by the landslides and floods. Barthas wrote that this contrasted greatly with other officers, who did not leave their dugouts even to obey calls of nature. On December 7th, Barthas' section got orders to occupy a shelter approximately a hundred meters from the front line, in a communication trench called the Mercier Trench. It was only five or six hundred meters away, and they expected to cover that distance in a half hour at most. But the mud made the going extremely slow, and at one point they had to stop and wait a whole hour for the 23rd company to pass by as it headed to the front line. Soon the rain came, and things became even more difficult. They passed the Tranchée du Moulin and envied their comrades there, even if water was starting to enter their dugouts. As they passed, they had enough strength to laugh at some whose shelters had collapsed and who were vainly trying to fix them. After that, they reached the uninhabited parts of the trench. Silence was absolute. They had entered the Mercier Trench. The rain became stronger, and the advance even more difficult. They were giving one step forward every five minutes. 
until they halted completely. They soon learned that several soldiers from a company ahead of them were stuck in the mud and they were trying to rescue them. No one knew how long they would stay there. All of a sudden they heard laughter, songs and happy shouts. It turned out they were right in front of the shelter for their captain and the company's officers. They were indifferent to the soldiers' suffering. If they can pass along the trench, then they should go on top of it, said their captain Cromereville, a cruel joke that produced roaring laughter. Some soldiers tried to take refuge in the steps leading to the captain's shelter, but he cruelly and pitilessly chased them out. Soon after, the laughter and singing returned to their well-lit and well-heated shelter. This was more than the soldiers could take. Many voices started shouting things like Enough! Enough! Scum! Crooks! It resulted in complete silence inside the shelter. Barthas wrote that one never knew how far anger could push a man and the idea of throwing grenades down the shelter steps was not foreign to some of them. Finally, they reached the spot where the company ahead of them had had trouble. They had left behind one man they did not manage to pull out of the mud. Barthas and his comrades made vain efforts to pull him out, almost pulling his arms out of their sockets, and when they realized it was impossible, they had to continue on their way. The unfortunate man begged them to put him out of his misery with a rifle shot, but the Poilus promised him that they would return in the morning to get him out, and gave him a shovel so that meanwhile he could try and save himself. Then they continued. They immediately realized that while they had been trying to rescue the man, the squad ahead of them had disappeared in the darkness. Their shouts received no answer, and the dark trench in the night was terrifying. From the darkness emerged the sound of big chunks of trench falling into the water, but they could not stay there under the rain, and so Barthas took the lead, with a shovel in one hand and his electric lamp in the other. His comrades doubted, but after a while around half of them followed him ten paces behind. Barthas was an old veteran of the trenches, because this was his second winter slogging through them. Besides the rationer Therese, who had stayed behind with the field kitchens, all the other members of the squad had spent their first winter of the war at home. Barthas gave them the advice he had learned from experience. Walk with your legs spread as wide apart as possible. Walk on your toes, not flat-footed. Take small steps. Don't stop. Finally, Eventually, they heard human voices and saw a light. They had reached the Mercier Trench. It was half past midnight, and they had been slogging through the water and mud for eight hours. Soaked and freezing, they would have given anything for a fire or a bit of straw. But these things were distant dreams for them. They spent the night clearing out the flooded shelter and scraping off the mud that covered the walls. Barely half the section had reached the shelter. The others only managed to rejoin them the next day. Out of fear of drowning or sinking, they had preferred to spend that terrible December night exposed in the trench. Then they all had to go back and rescue the ones who had sunk in the mud. Some lost their shoes and others wrenched hernias for themselves. But Barthas wrote that the strangest thing was that not one of the Poilus caught a cold. Their duty at the Mercier Trench was to keep it passable to the front line, but this was impossible with the torrential rains. One of those days, Barthas proposed to his sergeant that they could dig a communication trench that went straight to the front line. This would have avoided an enormous, unnecessary turn the Mercier Trench made, and would have been easier to maintain passable. But Barthas wrote that the idea was submitted to the captain, who in turn consulted with the commandant, who prudently took it to the colonel, who spoke about it with the general, who in the end hesitated because of the effect it might have on the symmetry of the sector. And so nothing was done about it. 
Meanwhile, the soldiers were truly drowning in the trenches. Entire areas had disappeared under the water, and most dugouts had collapsed. Martha's section was lucky to have a shelter that was still intact and where they could rest after their hard work. But one night the rain came down in torrents. Some of the men tried to build a dam to keep the water at bay, but it soon collapsed. The next day, December 10th, they and many other soldiers at places along the front had to get out of their flooded trenches to avoid drowning, and were greeted on the other side of no man's land by the German soldiers, who had had to do the same. Two armies faced each other, and not a single shot was fired. Their common sufferings brought the men together. Smiles, handshakes, comments, tobacco and canteens with coffee and wine were exchanged. Barthas wished they could all have spoken the same language. One day, a huge German stepped on a mound and gave a vivid speech, whose words only the Germans could understand, but whose meaning was clear to all when he smashed his rifle on a tree stump, breaking it in two. Applause broke on both sides, and the Internationale was sung. Barthas wrote that this was a sublime, beautiful spectacle. He only wished that they could all have together killed the monstrous leaders that were pushing men to brutally kill each other for no reason. When they heard of it, their leaders were furious. They could not allow this fraternization to continue. They later ordered the artillery to fire on any assemblies of men in no man's land, to slaughter Germans and Frenchmen indiscriminately. And when the front line was stabilized again, it was forbidden under penalty of death to leave the trench. It was all over. Of all this, in the end, Barthas wrote the following. Who knows? Maybe one day, in this corner of Artois, they will raise a monument to commemorate this spirit of fraternity among men who share the horror of war and who were forced to kill each other against their wills. Barthas wrote that despite the brutal orders, friendly contact between Frenchmen and Germans continued, especially along the listening posts. In the 21st Company, a private called Gontrain visited the German trench frequently and became friends with a German captain, a good family man who always asked Gontrain about his kids and who always prodded him to go back to the French trench if he tarried too long. Unfortunately for Gontrain, one day, while on his way back to the French positions, he was spotted by a lieutenant called Groulat. I've got you now, said the lieutenant. You'll be shot at dawn. Arrest this man. Nobody moved. Everyone stared in shock. Contrain, shaken by this, climbed over the trench, screaming in Occitan, Come and get me! And in two strides, he disappeared into the German trench, and never returned. That very afternoon, a court-martial made of the regiment's superior officers in five seconds condemned Paraivate Contrain to death in absentia. After an investigation, Lieutenant Groulois was put under arrest for frightening the private and causing his desertion, and the corporal and soldiers from Gontran's squad barely escaped court-martial for not firing on their comrade as he ran away. On December 13th, after a night of hard work, they were relieved, and at eight in the evening they arrived at the town of Agne. The next day, a hundred-man reinforcement arrived from Narbonne, and they were scattered across the regiment's companies. Among these were four men from Barthes's hometown of Periac Minerva. Adjutant Calvé, the man who in the seventh notebook was wounded in the shoulder, but still had the generosity to get the men out of the dangerous trench they had been in and back to a safer place, now recovered of his wound, and three others, Julien Chiffre, Louis Richardy, and Maurice Babou. By a stroke of good luck, these last three ended up in Barthes's half-section. They were shocked when they saw the state of Barthes and the others, completely covered with mud and looking like corpses. With these reinforcements, they also received the sudden news that the regiment would be dissolved. 
Barthas wrote that it was clearly due to the latest difficulties with the reinforcements. The division would go to the rear to reorganize, and so, on a cold evening of December 19th, they left the Neuville saint vast sector, which they had occupied since the 25th of September, for good. On Barthas' part, there were no regrets. The march itself was long and painful. The Poilus had been stuck in the trenches for three months, and their legs were weak. Night passed, noon arrived, and still they had not stopped for rest. The company had left the column at a fork in the road and was proceeding on its own. A few men gave timid cries asking for rest, but they were quickly suppressed. The captain paid them no attention at all, despite his big ears. Riding on his horse, he seemed to not wish to get his feet on the cold ground, instead wanting them to advance as fast as possible until they reached a place with comfortable lodgings for himself. After all, the captain had already told the soldiers once that a rest stop might be a custom, a favor, but it was not a right for a soldier on the march. He threatened with punishment all soldiers who stopped for a moment due to their tiredness. They finally reached the town of Baudricourt. Barthas wrote that despite the town having Beau in its name, which in French means beautiful, he did not find anything particularly pretty in the town. His section was billeted in a ruined loft which was missing several planks, could only be reached by a worm-eaten ladder, and had so many holes through which the wind and cold entered that the Poilus had to sleep under their tent cloths as if they had camped outdoors. Still they did not complain, thinking about the poor men who had stayed behind in the trenches of Neuville saint vast Later their superiors announced that two regiments of the division would be dissolved, Though they did not say which, everyone knew that the 280th regiment, to which Barthas belonged, was condemned. It came from Narbonne, which was famous as a socialist city, and so it would pay the price. Barthas wrote that their superiors probably intended the dissolution of the 280th as humiliation and punishment, but it meant nothing for the Poilus. Still, Barthas said he gave credit to their superiors for keeping in mind their southern sensibilities. Whole battalions would be kept intact and simply moved. Barthas's battalion would go to the 296th Regiment, and the other battalion to the 281st, and both these regiments were from southern cities as well. Their superiors also decided to allow the soldiers, as a supreme favor, to keep their 280th regiment badges in place for a while. But for the soldiers, it was meaningless what number they had on their badges. Then, they received the unexpected news that General Durbal, the commander of all the armies in the north, would come in person to review the regiment before it dissolved and salute its flag. This threw the officers into consternation. Captain Cromereville loaded them with inspections for 48 hours. He constantly reviewed the troops. Barthas wrote that up until that point, he had not seen the point of decorating his sleeves with the two woolen stripes that indicated his corporal's rank. He attributed it to the captain's myopia that he had never noticed. But this time, the captain, a man obsessed with stripes, noticed Barthas's empty private sleeves and stood speechless. Why don't you have any stripes? he asked. I've never had them. Everyone knows I'm a corporal, Barthas replied. Listen here. If your stripes aren't sewn on by tomorrow, you'll be sorry. Captain, I don't have any stripes, replied Barthas. Sergeant Major, give this man some stripes. But I don't know how to sew. At this... The captain threw Barthas a furious look and left. Barthas thought this saved him from obeying that order, but the next day, as soon as he got out of bed, the company's tailor appeared and sewed some fancy black stripes on his sleeves. After these inspections, the captain, perhaps wishing for recognition from the general himself, drilled the men rigorously, making them march back and forth the town's only road 
over and over again all day long, and always displeased with the results. At last, the big day came, December 23rd. They all assembled in a big field, waited for two hours until the general arrived, and all the usual goings-on of a military review happened. The general found everything perfect, gave a theatrical salute to the regimental flag, and that was it. The next day's report said that at the moment of the salute, a shiver went through the ranks. Barthas wrote that he also shivered, but it was only due to the cold. The next day, Barthas's battalion left for the nearby town of Iverny, where their new 296th regiment was stationed. Barthas's section was billeted in a filthy stable, which made them miss the rickety loft on which they had previously stayed. Then it was December 24th, and Barthas wrote. It was a sad Christmas Eve, gloomy and rainy. 1,916 years ago, Jesus was born in a stable. Like him, we made our beds there, but at least he had a bed of straw which wasn't like ours, filled with lice. And so we reach the end of this episode. So far we have seen more of the terrible and dangerous life of the men under constant winter rains that flooded and collapsed their trenches. Drowning or being buried alive are truly some of the most horrifying ways to die. We also see how men are getting angrier and angrier with their superior officers, and many of them are beginning to fraternize with the German soldiers. No matter which language they speak, they are all men, and it is a tragedy that war forces men who do not have any personal grudge against each other to fight and kill each other. And now we are approaching 1916, a new year of war. This will be a year where the 280th Regiment is no more. Barthas and his comrades now will fight in the 296th Regiment. But as Barthas would say, what would it matter to a man what number he wore on his uniform when he was maimed or murdered? We will continue with this notebook on the next episode. Until then, I hope you all stay well and safe, and have a good day.